Dan Toke Tom Nam La Chang Tu Badu Dagni Kiam Suchi Dagi Chun Yen Gipe Sonam Ki Droda Penche Sange Drumpa Shok Sange Chadang Toke Tom Nam La Chang Tu Badu Dagni Kiam Suchi Dagi Chun Yen Gipe Sonam Ki Droda Penche Sange Drumpa Shok So yesterday we talked, we just got a brief overview, Buddha's views. It's good to, to, to remind us, you know, what Buddha's saying, where Buddha comes from, where this information comes from, which then implies the way to listen to it. And I always like to point this out, you know. Um, if you're in a Christian church now, or in a Muslim place, or in a Jewish synagogue, you'd be hearing information, and then it, we, we, they'd be talking about God. So we tend to assume, well, it is true, if you're a Christian, a Muslim, or a Jew, the information you're hearing has come from God, who is not a person. And so naturally, because he's the creator, then it's something that we assume we're supposed to believe. We, this is how we talk in the world. It's a belief system, you know. So strictly speaking, you know, Buddhism is not a belief system, strictly speaking. I mean, okay, his holiness, when he talks to people in the world, he always says, yes, Buddhism is a belief system, because he does, because that's the way the world thinks, you know. But if you really strictly analyse it, belief, you know, belief assumes that you, you can't try, you can't check it. Belief assumes you can't prove it to be true. And because God is from on high, and the information is from him, and therefore is something to be taken and trusted and believed. So strictly speaking, that's not what Buddha is. We know this, and it's important for us to remember this. It's extremely important. Because Buddha's not a creator. It's very simple, you know. He's not the equivalent of a creator. What's fascinating, though, if you hear the qualities of God, and you hear the qualities of a Buddha, actually they're identical. This is kind of interesting. But the crucial difference is Buddhism doesn't assert that a being called an Arya being, the term even a superior being, I mean, Christians use that, but they only say there's one. The Buddha says every one of us can become one. That's the difference. Yeah. It's a massive difference, actually. I remember giving a conference. I part of, participated in a, a conference at the Catholic University in Melbourne, in Australia, a couple of years ago. And I just you know, I had a 15-minute talk, and I decided I'd discuss, look at, compare the characteristics or look at the similarities between the definition of God and the definition of a Buddha. And they're the same, you know. Um, I just looked up the Merriam-Webster dictionary, and there it was. God has three essential qualities. Omniscience, omnipotence, and infinite, infinite compassion. Well, that literally, uh, they literally are the characteristics of a Buddha. But the massive difference is Buddha, Mr. Buddha, the Indian, two and a half thousand years ago, who became a Buddha from his own hard work, who, you know, he says every being possesses the potential to become one of those. So, I mean, as a, to a Christian, that's, that's the worst sin of pride. It's like saying you can become your God. That's like outrageous. You can't talk like that. But this is the massive, I mean, it's not just a slight difference. It's a phenomenally massive difference between the Buddha's view and, the, say, the, for example, and, say, the Christians, the ones I'm familiar with. Even the Hindu teachings, that's where Buddha diverged from the Hindu teachings. So much from the Indian teachings are where Buddha came out of. Like I said yesterday, you know, it was these amazing Indians, you amazing Indians, who were the ones who began this discussion, as His Holiness points out, more than 3,000 years ago about the nature of self. And even these marvellous beings came up with this, there is the, the, and there were these different views about some essential essence that's there. And indeed, even, you know, the concept of a source of God, Many similar findings Buddha, Buddha has about karma, about all sorts of things, about the mind, so, much, so, simi so similar. But it's this fundamentally difference, that's where Buddha diverged. He went further. He said, no, there is not an inherent, permanent, real, findable s essence in there called a soul or a, or a spirit or a, a self. And don't just dismiss that word, oh, well, there's nothing there. He's not saying that. And indeed, there is no s fundamental primary source that's the source of everything else, which is, the, which is the idea of a creator. I mean, easy words to say. The differences in that sense are absolutely massive, you know. But it's okay. Things can be different. It's perfectly fine. And it's up to us to decide which our path is, you know. 
I mean, just recently, it's interesting for me, you know, what, back in, in the, late, the late 70s, when Tushita began in Delhi, and it was in, uh, where it was? Shanti, Shanti Park, is that a place? Where was it? Nik Shanti Nikita. Yeah, Shanti, that was there. I remember I'd go there, and I, I remember going visiting, and there'd be lots and lots of Indians in the group. But they were happy to be Hindus, you know. They like Lord Buddha because he's one, you know, he's one of yours. But now I'm noticing, 40 years later, it seems to be Tibetan Buddhists are becoming are born as Indians. And you, you all be, look at her. You're all becoming Buddhist. Look, she's a nun. So it's kind of curious. A whole new generation of Indians now. You're all Indian, but it seems like this next... So many Indians now. There were like 20, 15 Indians in the course I just gave. And they're becoming Buddhists, you know, not just staying Hindus and liking Lord Buddha. It's kind of fascinating. Tibetans are becoming Indians. Reborn this life as Indian. Because you want to, who knows, bring back Lord Buddha's teachings to India. I don't know. Must be, isn't it? Anyway, just talking. So Buddha, so Buddha is not a creator. Therefore, the way, and so therefore, the way to listen to this is not to go, oh yeah, yeah, I believe in Buddhism, I believe in karma, I believe in this, I believe in blah blah blah. You know, better than nothing. It's not bad to believe in something. At least Buddha is a person who who recommends morality, so good enough to believe in it. But that's not, it's, it's not enough. You got to do the work. You know, it's like saying you believe in mathematics. It's perfectly good to believe in mathematics because it does in fact work. But what good is it to you to really believe it? You've got to engage in it and comprehend it and use it. That's the point. And that's what, that's what practice is. So, so the way to listen to this, therefore, the way to listen to it is to listen, you know, respectfully, of course, but you, you know, but take it on board. So you decide, according to your own capacity, according to your own pace, to take on board what Buddha is saying. Because you have listened to it, thought about it, Buddha seems a reasonable person, you've checked up the people, you've checked up his holiness the Dalai Lama, a valid person, certainly he seems like a valid person, so you can have some confidence that he's speaking valid Buddhism, then good enough, you know, then start reading, listening, thinking about and taking it on board. But according to your pace, you don't, you don't just swallow it whole, nor do you reject it whole, you know. So it demands engagement. And that means with your, starting with your head, with your thoughts, with your noggin, Thinking, listening to it, thinking about it, and then applying according to our according to our capacity. You know. So, just a reminding summary: Buddha, Lord Buddha says his own observation, his experience is we are all sentient beings. The term in Tibetan, I love it. I don't speak Tibetan, unfortunately, but the word for sentient that we say in English, sentient being, is so delicious in Tibetan. Mind possessor, semchen, perfect word. Perfect word. And the Lord Buddha is saying there are trillions, and this is from his own observation, there are trillions of mind possessors pervading the universe. There is, in fact, in not an atom of space you won't find mind possessors. Now, we even know this with the creatures that are in the animal realm. I mean, our bodies are pervaded by beings. We're like a walking zoo, you know. We know this from our microscopes. We'd be repulsed if we saw, apparently they love our, creatures love our face, because these nice big fat paws, you know, they live in all these little paws. Under our arm is a zoo, is a zoo, you know, in bodies is a zoo. We know this. And they're just the ones we can see. Lord Buddha is, you know, um, positing there are countless sentient beings in all these realms of existence. And a realm of existence is just a mental state. That's all. Coming along with a certain level of physicality. So it's totally interesting. In the Vajrayana teachings of the Buddha, the, more, the most sophisticated, the most advanced you could say, which is which is the same system that in the, 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 the death process that we haven't got into yet, which we mentioned last night, which is really important for a Buddhist to understand the, what, the deconstruction of the person, the way a person dies and how to understand this death process. You know, we mentioned yesterday two things. There's the teachings on the eight stages of death. I mentioned it already, didn't I? I did. It's in your book. All the teachings are there. And then the other model that we discussed that are very important to understand is this business of the 12 links and the particular very powerful role of some of the 12 links at the time of death. And these two from different systems, Sutra and Tantra, but we need to understand them. So from the Vajrayana point of view, it's very helpful to understand the way a sentient being is constructed. And we need to understand this when we understand the death process. So we can familiarise ourselves with it during our lives. So that when we de death does come, we can at least have familiarised even intellectually this process so we can not be too shocked by what goes on. So we can hopefully, you know, die peacefully and well and begin to attempt to recognise the stages of death. Which of course the greatest yogis can do because they spent their lives meditating. So they can go through the death process with complete control. So the, the, the description of it is, is based upon the Vajrayana model, which is the same as the Tibetan medical system. And indeed, it's coming from the, all the marvellous, you know, the, the yoga system in India. Of course it is. 
and from that point of view, we're made up, let's also discuss that a bit now, this death process, what happens at death, based upon these different components of a person, based upon this particular model, which of course is not the materialist view, it's not discussing the brain, there's no mention of the brain, there's no mention of the brain, which doesn't mean it doesn't function, doesn't work, but it's another model, you know? So we're made up of the four, the universe, any universe, but let's just look at the one we occupy, that we call the Earth, you know. There are two phenomena, really. There's matter, which is made of the four elements. Now, this is the same model that was used, you know, a thousand years ago in the materialist, in the, in the Christian Jewish world, back in the 14th century or whatever, you know. That's how they describe things, the four elements. Now, of course, science has a million other different kinds of elements. It's a whole different way of describing now. But this is still standing. And this is the, this is the, the system of the Tibetan medical one. This, this, and they, which they study for years, this intimate, this in, in, intricate description of the physical phenomena, which is the four elements, which is the body and the, the universe out there. That's it. All matter is the four elements. And this is part of the, this is it, isn't it? The body is, is matter. And then you have minds, trillions and trillions of minds, consciousnesses, mind streams, semchens, sentient beings. And they're all, and the, and the interesting point is in this model, Vajrayana model of, the, of a person, the components of a person, you know, and it, in his, as His Holiness says, this wonderful book of His Holiness is, I forget who published it, it's, not, it's about the death, this process that we're describing, about this death process, called The Mind of Clear Light, I think, and it's, and it's the description of the, it's based on a Punch and Lama text, the, 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 the gradual, the, the process of death. It's a very wonderful book, very helpful book. So in there, as His Holiness says, you know, all minds, all minds, uh, have their own set of the four elements. Our minds are inextricably linked to our own set of the four elements. So, the death process is described in terms of eight stages. And it's a gradual collapsing or deconstructing of all the components of a person. So I think this is in your notes a little bit, so I can just you can refer to it if you want. What happens, what happens at death? I think page 21 is like a summary of this. And then the actual death process goes into more details later, you know? Oh, what happened? There we go. Yeah, what happens at death? So death occurs, I'm just, this is from Lama Zopa's book actually, I'll just read a few a bit, bits from it and I'll describe. So death occurs when the consciousness, the mind, in general, in Buddhism, these words are used synonymously. Keep remembering that Buddha does never refer to a thing called a spirit, a soul or a self. Just keep remembering that. He doesn't, he says we don't need one. Simple way of putting it. He says he has observed there's no such thing. But his view of the mind, you might as well, it's like you'll see what I'm getting at now, you listen carefully. So the word mind and consciousness are synonymous. And don't have your materialist view of the mind being the brain. Nothing to do with the brain for the Buddha. So death occurs when the consciousness, the mind, separates from the body. Even when the breath has stopped, you know, that is, that is what is called the outer breath. Or the brain doesn't function, or the heart doesn't beat. The person is not dead until the mind, the consciousness, leaves the body. So there's still the inner breath. And for this to stop and the consciousness to leave the body, it can take anywhere from a few seconds to three days after the outer breath has ceased. Or even longer for experienced meditators. You know, all these um, many, many meditators. You know, the stories of, I mean, we'll go into this, tell you about it later, and certainly the weekend we'll go over this. There's many stories of the great yogis, the great meditators, you know, who stay in meditation after they've stopped breathing for days, weeks, even months, even longer some, you know, there's many stories. And we'll discuss all that part as well. So this is already fundamentally different, you know, from the normal materialist view that happens in all the hospitals. This is why, you know, the ideal scenario is not to die in a hospital. You could almost argue the worst place to die is a hospital. The worst place to die, you could say that, even though nurses and doctors are really kind people. It's up the worst place, because one of the things, you know, okay, one of the things in, in Rimshay's book, and there's, I think again it's mentioned in here, before, you know, this whole book is, what's the problem? Have we got a problem? Okay. Okay. He's trying oh. to raise the camera a little bit more, actually. Oh, okay. Do you want me to lower myself down? Maybe it's easier <laughs> if I lower myself down. I'll shriek. 
okay, well, yeah, yeah, it should be. It's much better. When you're old, it's better to go from high because you've got double chins. <laughs> That's what people tell me. <laughs> I shouldn't care, should I? Is that right? Yeah. Good. <laughs> okay. I'll have to sit up straight then. No double chin. <laughs> okay. One of the things, one of the th you know, this book of Ramachais, the first part is like background about what is death, what happens, the eight stages, the 12 links, why attachment is the worst problem of death, which we can talk about more. But also, then the next main part of the book really is it's all geared to how to help your loved ones die. I mean, the information is for everybody, but clearly when you do certain things, when the breath stops, you obviously can't do it yourself. So the best of the book is addressed to how to help someone die. And then from this, you learn to do it yourself. So one of the crucial things, we'll go into all this as we go along, is to, is to make the place most conducive. Because, the, because death is very scary for most people, we've lived in denial of it all our lives, whether we're Christian or Muslims or whatever, or Buddhists, we still don't want to know about disappearing. And it's certainly if you're a materialist, you don't want to know about falling into a black hole. You couldn't wish for anything worse. So we live in total denial. And then we have to struggle to come to terms with it at the time of death, which is why it's so important to help people at that time. Literally to hold their hand through this difficult process. And then because of massive attachment to life and me and mine and my body, then there's so much fear. But so that therefore, the, the, it's so important. The ideal scenario for death would be a really quiet room beautiful with beautiful views for a person who's old or sick let's say assuming they're not unconscious yet that where just the person can be so peaceful to be peaceful often sick rooms and they're the, almost the opposite they're clanky and net loud with junk everywhere people gossiping you know the hospitals are so noisy doors banging other people crying loud noises it's the worst possible as the mind is getting more as you're getting as you're going towards death your mind gets much more Subtle, therefore your mind gets much more sensitive. And the smallest noise can be beyond distressing. And the crucial thing, the crucial point, the central point, the basis of all Ramitei's teachings, the basis of the whole thing about helping people at the time of death, is that you need to be peaceful and virtuous at the time of death. Peaceful and virtuous. And they go together. When the mind is virtuous, the mind is peaceful. Because why? Because, like we talked, we began to talk, at the time of death, this intense grasping rises up so intensely, which causes so much fear. And that's what triggers the karmic seed that will determine your next life. This is determined before you even stop breathing, you know, pretty much. So that it's got to be so quiet and peaceful. That's the whole point. And the point behind all of Ramachay's advice is to help the person be virtuous and peaceful. <coughs> So the first one is to have a really beautiful environment. And that means any, th and also because in the Buddhist view, everything that we experience through any of our senses, like ears, eyes, hearing, smelling, especially not this one, maybe this one perhaps is, but especially these two, touching, it leaves imprints in the mind. There's nothing goes astray. And so that means in that room, everything is to be there for the sake of the dying person. So let's say you're Buddhist. Whatever the person looks at should be reminding them of, of Buddha, reminding them of their guru, reminding them of their practice. You know, whatever they hear, same thing. It's really important to understand this and understand the way karma works so you know how to help a person. You understand about attachment. You understand about the way the senses work. You understand how the impression that's left on people's minds is, stays there and why you want them to have those impressions. Because when they die, you want the Buddha, you know, them to have a... Um, Imprints of the Buddha, imprints of the Guru, imprints of the teachings. It's kind of, it's got a lot, it's lo, it's got a technical logic to it, but you have to understand it. This is why Rupert says this is education we all need, you know. So of course, if your grandma's a Hindu, you don't tell her about Lord Buddha. You tell her who she wants. If your mummy's a Christian, you don't tell her about Jesus, Buddha. You talk about Jesus to her. You use your common sense, you know, to help her mind be peaceful. To help her mind be peaceful, so important. This is the essence of it. So anyway, the death, the eight stages of death. We'll just not, I'll just go through the summary first of the components of a person, the way they're described, according to this Buddhist model, the Vajrayana model. So we're made of, a, one, of the, one of the packages, this is page 21, one of the pack, ways of packaging a person, if you like, according to Buddhist teachings, is called the five aggregates. I mean, we could spend the rest of the week just discussing this, but there's no reason to go into it in more depth. But it, it, it's, it's significant here, mainly because each, the death process is described and each of these aggregates is sort of ceasing to function during the stages of death. 
And the more we understand them, of course, the more this helps us understand the whole process. But I think there's no reason to go into it in depth here. But in general, the five aggregates, Buddha gave a teaching, a sutra, and he sort of described how we're made up, what we're made up of. So basically you could argue we're made up of body and mind, that's it. The mind is the sensory consciousnesses, our capacity to cognize through our eyes and ears and so forth, which is mind, and then our mental consciousness. Then you've got, you see, but here, for his own reasons, Buddha selected two. Okay, when you study the Buddhist model of the mind, you learn about the different states of mind. And then again, this is coming from the, Indi, from the Hindu tradition, same basis, understanding of the cognitive process, the mind itself. So there's different conceptual states of mind. So the reason Buddha, he chose these two here called feeling and um, discrimination. And it's a bit abstract here unless we go into more depth, so, but I won't go into more depth here, there's no need. But these play a really powerful role in the way attachment runs our lives. And maybe we'll talk about this as we go along. We need to understand attachment from the Buddhist point of view because it really do, is the source of so mu most of our suffering. According to the Four Noble Truths, the very first teaching the Buddha gave, according to the Four Noble Truths, attachment is the main cause of our suffering day to day. So if we don't understand what he means by that, it's quite a shock, because we use that word in a good way. So we better know what he means by it, and we'll go into it as we talk, you know. So he plucks out as one of the most important of these components of a person, this, this um, capacity for, for feeling. We have a pleasant feeling, an unpleasant feeling, or neutral feelings, and we have these a thousand times a day, and there's no fourth category of what they call feelings. Pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And these play a massive role, because another word for pleasant is called happiness. Happy feelings. We all crave happy feelings, it's pretty obvious. So the craving is attachment. We, our attachment is like this motor that runs us and all it wants every second is happy feelings, pleasant feelings. And it can't stand unpleasant feelings. That's what we call unhappiness. So we all, as being samsaric beings, spend our lives driven by this motor called attachment, which is this craving inside us, ever so subtle, and indeed at grosser levels as well, that only wants the nice things. And basically at the moment, Buddha says, being in samsara means we mainly follow attachment every second. I'm uncomfortable, so I move my leg. Why? Because attachment only wants nice feelings. I'm hungry, so I put food in my mouth. Why? Attachment doesn't like empty stomachs. I'm tired, I go to sleep. Why? Because attachment doesn't feel, want to feel miserable. So everything we do mostly, and it seems so innocuous to us, and it seems rather cruel of Buddha to point it out and say that attachment's our motivation. It's just normal life. All he says, join the club. We're all in this place called samsara, and we're driven by this delusion. So because we're junkies for good feelings, he puts in their feeling as one of these important components. Another one is this other part of our mind that's called discrimination, which happens every millisecond, and there's like this clarity, this ability to distinguish what we're seeing and doing and feeling every second. So again, too, it plays a massive role in, in, in pointing out in our own selves what is the cause of happiness and what's the cause of suffering in terms of attachment. So these two, he, he makes them important. But basically, it's the body and the mind. The body and the mind, the, the five act, but the, he divides it a bit more, okay? There's no need to go into too much detail. And then we're made, as I said, of the four elements. The four elements. Earth, fire, earth water, fire, and air. And each of these, during the death process, kind of gradually deconstruct, and we'll go into it. The next one is now, this is from the Vajrayana model in particular, we've got, and this is very helpful to understand this, we're made up of, you know, our consciousness goes through different stages, it's got different levels of its capacity for cognition, it's the only way to say it. So that we've got gross consciousness, gross consciousness, or the coarsest level of our capacity for cognition, which is... That what we function day to day through the, in this human body of ours, we have our sensory consciousness, which is part with the gross consciousness, and then there are certain aspects of our capacity to cognize things that are, you know, some are more subtle. But basically, the grosser level is what we what we posit as existing in the materialist view. So this, the the first four stages of the eight stages of death are the ceasing of the various components of the four elements, the five aggregates, and the various parts of our gross of body. So we have gross consciousness, which is inextricably linked with our gross body, which is this bag of bones we've got right here. So when you stop breathing, which is the fourth of the eight stages, that's when the world says you're dead. 
your breath stops, but you're not dead yet. And this is a massively important point if you want to help your loved ones properly. And you'll see as we talk, there's many obstacles not understanding this. Because the Buddhist view would say it could take up to three days for your subtler level of consciousness to leave the body. But by the time the gross consciousness, you know, so anyway, we've got gross body and our gross consciousness, which is the day-to-day -day life. Then we've got subtle consciousness and the subtle physical energy that it's linked to inextricably. Now, this, you know, this is in the yoga system, which is where the Vajrayana comes from. And this talks about the subtler physical components. And that's, there's this subtle nervous system they describe, 72,000 different subtle channels. Not, they're physical, but they're not visible to the eyes. You can't see them with a microscope. But nevertheless, they're said to be this subtle physical energy. <clears throat> and then through these subtle physical channels is coursing these subtle wind energies or prana. The same character, if you like, as the air energy of the world, but a subtler level. And these are the, these are the components that the, the Tibetan doctors, and no doubt the Ayurvedic medicine system, your system as well, deals with the different wind energies. I mean, there's enormous knowledge about these in one of those Tibetan doctors. She'll feel your pulses, and she's feeling all the different wind energies that are going on in there that are crucial to your health, and feeling the imbalance of those wind energies. But what's fascinating, all of those wind energies, and this is the thing, are intimately linked with all these different subtler states of your mind. So all the different states of mind, like attachment and anger, for example, have their own wind energies. So when your Tibetan doctor feels your pulses and she feels an, Im an imbalance of these certain wind energies, then they call it like the lung disease, an imbalance of the winds, and you're, you've got there's all this anxiety and heavy breathing. That's attachment energy gone berserk, which pollutes your winds. You've got you know different energy, like strong anger energy, that's polluting those particular winds, and this is what causes the imbalance you know, of, of your, in your body. This is how they talk, right? So these wind energies connected to your subtler levels of mind, all coursing through these channels. So among these channels, you've got what they call a central channel, which is just in front of your spine, towards the back of your head, obviously. And it comes all the way up from the spine up to the top of your head. And it goes all the way down and ends at the, at, at the sex organ, the male at the tip of the penis and the female at the cervix. And then in each of these, and then you've got two side channels, it seems, and they both start here, it seems. They go up and they run along the, the central one all the way down, end at the end as well. And then you have all these others. So basically, they then talk about it in different places. These channels are all kind of knotted together. So up here, there's a coming together of a bunch of these channels. And this, this, this when everything's blocked, the, you know, the, these channels are blocked, they talk about. And so here they talk about, and that's this, they talk about a chakra. It's just the coming together of a bunch of these channels here, 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 below the navel, and then three down below, inside for the females and outside for the male. So the death process, as it uh, you go through the first stages of the four stages, the next stages of death are the gradual, again, ceasing, deconstructing of these physical components. And so what's happening is, you know, <laughs> is the different wind energies and their different associated states of mind are gradually all moving up and moving down and everything ends up at the heart chakra. This spot in the centre of your breast. And this is, what's interesting about this is this is where you begin in your mother's womb. What happens in the mother's womb when you're conceived, and we're, you know, we'll get to conception at some point, we're leaping ahead of death here, but let's just pretend from the back to the beginning. When we got conceived in our mummy's womb, our, our, okay, so your subtle, gross consciousness, subtle consciousness, and that starts once you stop breathing. And then with the final one is called very subtle consciousness or extremely subtle consciousness. And the, it too is, this is the subtlest level of your being. Every, when everything is finished, everything has come up, everything's come down, and all that is left at the heart chakra is your very subtle consciousness, inextricably linked with this very subtle wind energy. As his holiness says, you know, they're virtually one, they're, inex, they're inextricable. They're virtually one entity, but still technically, one is called very subtle consciousness, one is called very subtle body or wind energy. And these are the building blocks of the next person. So also, you could roughly speaking, say all the imprints of all the karma you've ever done since the beginning of time that hasn't yet ripened as experiences or as lives is all stored there. It's like programmed. And we carry that with us, you know. So this is very subtle consciousness and very subtle wind at the heart chakra. That's it, it, this, you could get 
from a, when you die, when you stop breathing, you, everything goes to there, and then it can stay there for up to three days. And there's very easy ways to check when the consciousness has gone. We'll discuss all this as we go along, you know. But this is a really important point to understand because, you know, because obviously, because in the hospitals, you're dead when you stop breathing. Get rid of the body as soon as possible, you know. It's going to start stinking. But it doesn't, you know, until the mind leaves the body. So this is why, really, the ideal scenario is to die at home. Ideal. Or, if you're rich enough, you can hire your own room in the hospital, isn't it? You know, you can stay there as long as you like, pay the rent. But it's best to have this time. So anyway, gross consciousness and gross body, first four stages, we'll go through them. Subtle consciousness and subtle body, which is really, you know, we're not aware of this. And then very subtle consciousness. So what happens when you're conceived in your mummy's womb, or your mummy's fallopian tube, or wherever it is? I'm not sure. What happens is, a subtler, this very subtle consciousness is inextricably linked with what they call the indestructible drop. And it's made up of, it's very tiny, like a little tiny pea or a bean, they say, with a red and a white half. That's what they say. And so this is from the mother and father. So the, the gross, the subtler aspect of the sperm from the father, they refer to that as the white drop. Of course, the material, the science doesn't talk about this. The subtler energy of the female egg, they call it, is this red drop, they call it. And these two are what your, your, your consciousness, when you die, you go into, you leave the body, you have spent time in the intermediate state, depending on the person, how long that could be, up to seven weeks, they say. And then when your new mummy and daddy hop into bed, like in our case, when we were conceived in our mummy's womb, we were bopping around, waiting, hanging out in this bardo, intermediate state, kind of desperately looking for another rebirth, sort of, you know, joking a bit. And then your new mummy and daddy come together, boom, you run like a magnet. And your very subtle consciousness then joins that indestructible drop. And, that, and, you, and you start at your heart chakra. That's where you begin, according to this d description. You begin there and everything gradually grows down and up and you become this little fetus and out you come and off you go again, you know, another life. But what's very curious, by the way, it's very interesting, in the um, description of the 12, li of the, uh, the description of the 12 links, they talk about the last 10th and 11th, our old age, so sorry, birth, old age and death. Well, birth in the 12 links is considered to be the first second of conception in your mummy's womb. But guess what old age is called? That starts the second moment in your mother's, in, in, after conception. It's old age from there, it's downhill from there, sorry. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're not responding to me like you're hearing me at all. Most people <laughs> laugh when I say this, but you obviously didn't hear me. I'll say it again. The 12 links, according to the 12 links, this description of Lord Buddha of how we perpetuate our lifestyle, lives from life to life to life. The, the description, the 12 links, the last two are called, 11th is called birth, the 12th is called old age and death, okay, in these cycles. So birth is considered the first moment of conception in your mother's womb. Old age begins the second moment after conception. Are you hearing me? Yeah. It's hilarious. Isn't it not funny? Yeah. So when I, have, when I see babies now, I, I have to refrain from saying, oh my God, they're nearly dead already, you know? <laughs> I mean, you can't say that to a mother when you've got a brand new baby. It's just beginning. But from Lord Buddha's thing, old age begins the second, second moment after conception in your mother's womb. And then all that's left is death after that, you know? So it's an exciting way of saying it, isn't it? Not very, exciting, not very appealing. So anyway, whatever. So the... the um, Okay, so the eight stages of death, let's get, I think, well, the components, we've been through those, the, four, the five aggregates, the four elements, and then the channels, the winds, and the chakras, all this business. And then, indeed, this red and white drop they talk about. And there's more to say about all that. But, yeah. <clears throat> so, basically, at the moment, I'll just read what Rupert says. It's good, his, his teachings are so helpful. So, the wind energies of the subtle body, more subtle than the air we breathe, they carry our mind through a system of 72,000 channels throughout the body. It's said that our consciousness, our mind, rides on these winds. So, like I said, they have a very intimate relationship with your health. And that's why the body and mind have this intimate, inextricable relationship. It's so obvious, you know. The main channels are the central channel, as I said, and the right and the left. I told you all that. So at the moment of conception in our mother's womb, you know, our consciousness mixed with the red drop, or the red body cheetah, they sometimes call it, from the mother and the white drop from the father. 
So the essence of this conjoined white and red body cheetah, known as the indestructible drop with its red and white halves, the size of a tiny bean, abides in the very centre of our heart chakra. So, okay, so the clear light mind of death. The last stages of death, known as the eighth, you know, the eighth stage, when you get to the very subtle consciousness or extremely subtle consciousness, that's often known as the clear light consciousness. Clear light consciousness. So while we are alive, the knots at the chakras prevent the winds from entering into and flowing in the central channel. Otherwise, these various winds and the states of mind associated with them would all dissolve into the indestructible drop at the heart chakra, at which point our extremely subtle consciousness, the mind of clear light, would manifest, and with it we could meditate on emptiness and thus free ourselves from all illusions, eventually becoming enlightened. This is exactly what the yogis are able to do. The yogis have practiced throughout their lives going through their meditation stages, going to the subtle, to then even indeed, if they can, to the very subtle level. They're able, with their immense power of focus and their power of past morality and their power of their hard work, they're able to bring all these energies consciously to the, to the, into the central channel. And that's where the mind is more subtle. Because the grosser consciousness, when we're wide awake and wound up, bopping around daily life, our, the winds are going through all the channels all over the body, and then that's why we can feel things with our body, that's why we can hear, and all the rest. It has a huge uh, role in the way we are conscious every day. So what happens is, you see, sleep is very interesting. Sleep is exactly the same process as death. Identical. That's why the yogis can use their sleep. You go through the same eight stages at sl during sleep. The difference is there's a more radical deconstruction, dissolution of all these energies, obviously. But when you stop breathing, for example, then you wake up, don't you, into your dream state. That's your subtle consciousness. This is a technical term in the Vajrayana. Subtle consciousness is, is, is your dream mind. The only time we touch our subtler level of mind, which in its nature is more potent, but we don't know how to use it because we're not meditators, you know, that's your subtle consciousness. That's what dreams. And most of it's just this weird, strange experiences, aren't they? And often we don't even remember them. But your subtle consciousness is super powerful. And the great yogis, with their powerful Vajrayana skills, Vajrayana practice and their focus and their concentration, are able to go through these stages of dissolution to get to their subtle level of mind, but not actually become unconscious. They're conscious at a subtle level. And that's what they practice all their lives. And that's why there's a chapter in the book that's called, that says, death is what the yogis have been waiting for. I mean, this sounds shocking to us. Because they practice all their lives going through this process, familiarizing themselves with it. But the death is the most radical level of the very subtle conscious. And they're looking forward to that so they can do their meditating, realize emptiness, and get, get, get realizations. Because this, the very subtle consciousness is like the most potent level of our mind, the most capable. It's like the microscope of our mind that is able to m sort out all the rubbish, get rid of all the delusions and become enlightened for the greatest yogis. But we've all got this potential. So sleep is what the yogis can use. They can go through this process so they don't actually ever become unconscious, you know. That's the point. So learning about this is very fascinating and very, very helpful for us to understand. So throughout their lives, the great meditators, as I've been saying, train their minds to do this. Lama Yeshi, for example, the founder of the center and the organization that we're part of, Lama Zobrimche's teacher, in his daily pra tantric practice, was able to experience the various visions of the dissolution process that occur naturally at death. In other words, he didn't need to wait until death to experience these. Lama was able to open the chakras, causing the winds to enter into and flow in the central channel and dissolve at the heart chakra, and thus could meditate in the clear light. Therefore, at the time of death, the great yogis can remain in meditation in the clear light for as long as they like. Which is what happened with Lama. So the process of death occurs in eight stages and is experienced in those who have bodies constituted from the sperm of the father and the egg of the mother human beings and some animals. Well, this is really interesting lately, isn't it? I, 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 I wanted, I, someone explained to me, I wanted to understand cloning. You know how they cloned that sheep, Dolly or something? It's really fascinating, this, because they didn't use an egg and a sperm. They didn't get, they got the, they got a cell from one female sheep 
and, and did tr tricky things with it and joined it, fused it with a cell of another sh female sheep. So they've got two female cells and then a consciousness obviously must have gone to those two female cells. So that's a really interesting discussion because it doesn't, it's showing this is not, this is, you know, it's fascinating. And they, even recently I heard there's a whole bunch of little doggies they created. They didn't create them, but they provided the cells, but not again, eggs and sperms. So, you know, ask the different geshis and they don't know what to say here, you know, so I have to get the yogis to look into it, you know. It's very interesting. So during the first four stages, we experienced a gradual dissolution of the... T okay, there's one way they describe it is the deconstruction of the whole process is the deconstruction of these 25 different components. They're all involved, they're all described there, but, we, you know, we'll touch on them roughly. The breath, so the breath has stopped by the end of the fourth stage, and by then the gross consciousness has ceased. And of course that's when they, we think normally you're ready for the body bag, but you're not dead yet, you know. During the final four stages, you know, the, and all these other things continue. I'm not going to detail it here. I'm not going to say it. So as I said, you know, the eighth stage, all that's left is the extremely subtle wind conjoined with the extremely subtle consciousness, the mind of clear light, as the indestructible drop of the heart. So death occurs when the indestructible drop splits open and the conjoined, extremely subtle wind and mind leaves the body. So the point here is why it's so important to help people at the time of death, as I've been saying, and we're going to stress this again, is because it's at the time of death, before you stop breathing, that the karmic seed that will, okay, in our case, remember she mentioned this, remember I said yesterday, we can say for us, in our past life, you know, um, whether we were a kangaroo, as remember she said, an elephant or a human, could have been. The period, when, you know, the period before you stop breathing, so this is what we're going to go through now, the eight stages. It's about then. It's hard to say. When all the lamas give this commentary on these eight stages, they very rarely tell you when it starts. And if you talk to people who, live, who work a lot with the dying and who even are a bit familiar with these eight stages, some people say it works. It's hours before they stop breathing. But usually it seems like, and the way Rinpoche describes it, it could be a couple of hours before you stop breathing, that the actual process of this eight stages happens, this, this deconstruction process, this dissolution. It's hard. See, that's why you've got to be familiar with it yourself. And if you are helping your loved ones, you've got to know, even helping your dog die, you know, knowing what, when the process has started. Because it's around that period, as you're gradually losing the plot, it's then that the jet, this powerful grasping is triggered, which triggers your the, the karmic seed that will be the one that in our case in our case was already programmed in that past life for us to go to our present mother's human womb that was already virtually it seems virtually sorted out before we even stop breathing in that life and that's why the person needs you most right then that's when they need you to help them be peaceful calm, saying the prayers to them, showing the pictures of their gurus, talking about their lama, hearing the prayers, doing their practices to help them through that process. Because when their mind is peaceful then, and virtuous with all the imprints of the Buddhas, and their mind is so sensitive already, it'll go in very deep, including your dog, including the mouse, including the ant. Don't just kill it, you know. That's when they need, the, especially because their mind's getting more subtle, they're very receptive to anything they see and hear. And, and then by dying with the image of the Buddha, the sound of the Buddha, your little mouse, it can take a human birth, you know. The Buddha can grab it. So you can almost think of that. So that's why it's so important, that period. And that's whether your, your loved one's in a coma. We all tend to think in the world that if they're in a coma, they're peaceful. Don't be ridiculous. You know very well, you can be fast asleep, you can be looking quite quiet, your body, but you can be having a nightmare. That's your subtle consciousness, and that's often a coma. A person who's freaking out, and they give them all these drugs to make their body quiet, but that doesn't mean their mind is quiet. And that's when the person, you know, again, prayers and practices can help even when they're in a coma. There's many stories about this. I remember one time, a friend of mine in Sydney went into a deep coma. They didn't think she'd come out of it. She was really old, and she, they thought this is the end of her, you know? She was in the ICU. And she, she'd been, she hadn't, wasn't really a Buddhist, but she was very close to his holiness Sakya Trinzen and his family. When they come to Australia, she'd always have them there. And she had Song Sa Kyen Serebrache staying for six months in her house. 
you know. So she, she liked these lamas and she collected Tibetan artifacts and things. But she wasn't really a Buddhist. But anyway, she was in a deep coma in the ICU and her husband, it was funny, he was a judge and he, he asked me, I said, can I come and see her? And night is always the best, you know, because it's quiet then. So when he, he, the judge rang up the ICU nurses and said that this Buddhist nun would wants to come, that I was her pastor or something, you know. So when I got there, they were nervous and they said, don't, please don't ring bells. I said, I promise I won't ring a bell. <laughs> that God knows what concept they had of a Buddhist nun, you know. So what I did was just very simple. I sat by Judy's bed. Well, she was quite high, all these things in her, you know, deeply unconscious. And I just whispered loudly in her ear, different prayers, you know king of prayers, different things. And every now and again, I'd say, Judy, Song Sa Kensei Rinpoche is praying for you. Judy, His Holiness Sakya Trinzen is praying for you, you know? So anyway, the fact is, she came out of a coma. I mean, she still didn't have the karma to die, obviously. She came out of a coma. And she was all perky and happy and everything was fine. But she said the only thing she remembered, the only thing she remembered was this husky voice, she said. She had no idea it was me. She said he thought it was a blue lady coming through the window. This husky <laughs> voice saying, Judy, Song Sao Ken Se is praying for you. Judy, His Holiness Sakya Trin is praying for you. And she was unconscious. So never think, because your old granny's unconscious, you can sit there and gossip, you know? It's completely wrong. And this is a very fascinating point. Because, you know, we, I remember one time ever I had this experience. But I find it very helpful, because you hear many people talk about it like this. When I was at, did my first retreat ever at Tushita, when I first became a nun, it was early 78, I did this, you know, three months retreat. And just for a couple of weeks, I think, it was a very, a very interesting experience. It helped me a lot understand this process. That I'd, I'd go, we have our nap after lunch, you know, I'd go to sleep. And then for this two week period, I had, I think they call them lucid dreaming. I had this vividest, crystal clear dreams, like as if it was a, a novel, you know. But what was fascinating was I was completely conscious of all the noise all around and all the conversations and everything everybody was doing. So that's like being in a coma. It, it is. The dream mind is like the coma mind. It's the same. But I was completely conscious of all the noises and all the people talking. So that can be when your lover's in a coma. There's no question. That can happen. That's why it's so important to, you know, to, um, to be quiet and peaceful, especially then if the person's in a coma or if they're drugged out of their mind. You know, that's when they need you most. But I remember that story years ago, I don't know if it was here. This Italian mother refused to let them pull the plug on her boy. He went into a coma. He was in a coma for 25 years. He came out of his coma and he said he was conscious the whole time. Isn't that shocking? He died eventually, but he was conscious the whole 25 years. Because, in other words, you can you're gonna argue, if we go through this process, you'll see what I'm saying. His earth element didn't, hadn't come back, couldn't come back. So he was lying there in a coma, but conscious.